As 2017 closes for My Life in Gaming, we find ourselves looking back on how we did. And of course, the games we played throughout the year. We thought it was about high time we made a tradition of sharing our yearly game reflections. Specifically, these are games that we played through from beginning to end for the first time this past year, marking them as beaten on our backloggery pages. Some of these games were released in 2017, while many others are much older. So let's get to it. This is a selection of games that we beat in 2017 that left the biggest impression. What seems to be a reoccurring theme these past few years, I didn't get a chance to play a lot of games outside of stuff for the show. This has everything to do with the fact that I'm a parent with two kids, and because of that, anything that has to do with games takes a lot longer than it used to. A good outlet for me to sit down and play through some games not intended for an episode has been our regularly scheduled Sunday night live streams. In addition to some old favorites, I finished several games, new and old, that would be among my favorites this year. 2017 was definitely the year of the limited physical copy. Yeah, the practice has been on the rise since B-Blank and Limited Run Games popularized it, but this year saw tons of additional boutique publishers step in. Out of all these boutique publishers, I felt that the online import retailer, PlayAsia, had some of the nicer releases on offer. Now this, this is what I'm talking about. Curse Casilla is a side-scrolling arcade action game that plays homage to Capcom's Ghouls and Ghosts series in the purest form. This game in particular falls more in line with Ghouls and Ghosts more than any of the other sequels, which is good because that's the best one anyways. Man, I just adore the graphical style of this game. The gorgeous pixel art really emulates the feel of a classic arcade game, and hey, it even plays in a 4x3 aspect ratio. Perhaps the most interesting thing about Curse Castilla is that it was almost entirely developed by one person, Spanish developer Loco Molito. He's made a number of different games that play homage to various arcade games, and I'm definitely a fan now. I'm on board for any other console releases he does in the future. The second game I purchased from PlayAsia is Ghost Blade HD, a fantastic vertically scrolling bullet hell shooter. It was developed by Hughcast Games, an independent developer who got their start making Dreamcast games, if the Fantasy Star Online inspired name didn't quite give it away. Now, I love me some shooters, despite never being able to put in quite the amount of time needed to get really good at them. While this might not quite reach cave levels, it's super fun to play and just flat out well made. Three characters to choose from, several difficulties, and a caravan style score attack give you plenty of bang for your buck. For me, a big part of the appeal of a shooter is the rock and soundtrack, and Ghostblade delivers a top notch effort. This version includes an additional remix OST by Sir Flash of Studio Mudprints, who produces the absolutely amazing YouTube series Bullet Heaven. If you're a shooter fan, check it out. Okay, so both of these releases came in limited editions that includes a number of goodies, but nothing too huge, which is how I like my special editions anyways. Although these are a little bit pricey right now, hopefully they'll be getting some non-LE editions in 2018 for anyone to be able to buy. Even though it was released in late December of 2016, I finally got to spend some time with Wild Guns Reloaded. This port slash remaster of the original Super NES game was something of a surprise announcement. I guess this was some sort of a fun side project for the same team that made the original game. Here they pretty much took the SNES graphics, scaled them to HD, opened up the playing field to widescreen, and added a couple of new playable characters and levels. Oh yeah, it's also four players. Local only though. Wild Guns is an arcade style third person shooter almost reminiscent of an on rails shooter but you typically don't move through a level in the same way. I guess the term gallery shooter would be more apt. Think like Cabal on the NES or Dynamite Duke on the Genesis. 
On a side note, I'd say the Wild Guns Reloaded has one of the best CRT style filter implementations I've ever seen, adding in scan lines and a touch of convergence the higher you go. Although for a long time I wished that I had the SNES cart, but this new version is a total and complete replacement that makes me okay with never owning that version. Wild Guns Reloaded was really special for me too, and it was a ton of fun to co-op. Well, I wouldn't say no to the SNES cart for a crazy low price or something. I agree with everything Corey said about this definitive PS4 version, and Doris is just flat out fun to play as. Another retro remake that I played in 2017 was the incredible Wonder Boy The Dragon's Trap. It's no secret that we're pretty big fans of the Monster World branch of the Wonder Boy series, and I've gotta say, playing through this version gave me an even greater appreciation for this particular entry. The love that developer Lizard Cube has for the game oozes out of every frame of animation and piece of music, and I just can't help but love it as much as they do. This year I played through the three mainline entries in the Panzer Dragoon series, the first two on Saturn and Orta on the Xbox. I would say that the original made the strongest impression on me in large part due to its limited continue system allowing me to get more acquainted with the game overall. Spy feels more driven by atmosphere than action which is cool in its own way but it was kind of over before I knew it. As for Orta, wow what an impressive game but I don't think I played it quite right and my dragon was not properly leveled up, leading to five hours of attempts against the final boss during our marathon for extra life in November. For better or worse, I don't think I'll ever forget that. Another Sega series that I played through this past year was the loose trilogy of Mickey and Donald games for the Genesis. I half-heartedly bought Castle of Illusion at a retro shop in Albuquerque, New Mexico while passing through on summer vacation, just because it's an iconic Genesis game, but I never really thought it looked all that good. But boy was I wrong. It's hard to convey exactly why, but it absolutely lives up to its reputation. It's just simple, but very well-crafted platforming. Quackshot, or I Love Donald Duck as it's called in Japan, was also quite good, but a bit less straightforward to progress through. World of Evolution also has some interesting stuff going for it, but feels less solidly grounded overall. Twenty seventeen marked the first year that I ever beat games on a few consoles that I'm new to. Even though I got my Sega CD in twenty sixteen, I hadn't finished a game for it until Road Avenger this past year. And boy, what a literal wild ride! If you're an FMV fan who hasn't played it, like I somehow hadn't, you're gonna love it. While I have played some Turbo Graphics games on Virtual Console, the Japanese version of Bonk's Adventure, known as PC Genjin, became the first game that I played through from start to finish on actual PC Engine hardware. And I decided that with the launch of the Xbox One X, I would get into the Xbox One family of consoles, with the first game I finished on the platform being the gorgeous Ori in the Blind Forest a masterpiece of Metroid-like design that might be better than a lot of actual Metroid games. Can't wait for Ori and the Will of the Wisps. Of course, I also beat my first games on Nintendo Switch this year, but we'll come back around to that a bit later. 
I'm always on the lookout for more fun, lower profile NES and Famicom games, and this year I especially enjoyed Gargoyle's Quest 2 and Jackie Chan's Action Kung Fu. Gargoyle's Quest 2 is the last game I needed to finish in the trilogy that began with the Game Boy original and ended with Demon's Crest, and it might just be my favorite, such a wonderful Capcom series. As for Jackie Chan, now that is just one heck of a fun looking and fun to play NES game, but don't take my word for it. Check out Game Dave's review in the unbelievably produced season finale of his storyline series that he finished in July. But don't forget to start from the beginning. Assorted other retro games that I finished for the first time in 2017, Spyro the Dragon is a surprisingly well-aged first entry in an iconic PlayStation series that I've always been curious about but ignored for a long time. But it just plays wonderfully with a DualShock controller, and while the level design may not be particularly notable, I'm really looking forward to playing the rest of Insomniac's PS1 Spyro games. Avenging Spirit is a game whose existence I didn't even know about until early in the year, and it looks so good that I just couldn't get it out of my mind until I ran across a copy at Too Many Games. This is a Game Boy adaptation of an arcade game, and the quality and charm of the character sprites is some serious top-tier Game Boy stuff. You play as a spirit who can only survive outside a possessed enemy body for a short time. I mean, how can you say no to a game where you can play as a fire-breathing kangaroo? Definitely a kangaroo. Absolutely one of my top favorites for the year. Dynamite Cop for the Dreamcast was a game I had my eye out for at conventions all year, and I finally found it at a local shop. Now this is just a stupid and fun game, mostly because it's stupid and it knows it's stupid. I know Corey had a great time with this one in December. Seriously, Dynamite Cop. It was just so over the top and stupid that I could not help but love it. I mean, can you name another game where a hostage situation takes a quick detour to brawl with the Kraken deep within the holds of a cruise ship? The Kraken! Bunk's Revenge is the game I've been meaning to get around to since I beat the original on the Wii Virtual Console so many years ago. I liked the first game, but there's just something about the momentum-based controls that didn't gel with what I was expecting. Revenge is generally considered to be the best Bonk game, and if any game in the series was going to click with me, it'd probably be this one. Once I finally understood that the key is not to rush and take your time on a level, things fell in place for me, and in the end, I loved it. My interest in future entries in the series is completely revived, which feels great because I'm a huge fan of Bonk's character design. Being a Sega kid growing up, my love for Shinobi is a given. I was always on top of the series, but surprisingly, I never got around to playing the Saturn entry, Shinobi Legions, before this year. Legions combines two things that I love, Super Shinobi style gameplay and 90s digitized characters and FMV. I mean, really, a Shinobi game with Mortal Kombat style graphics? Kind of an unexpected approach to the series, and in 1996, probably a huge mistake. But in 2017, amazing. I was a little bummed that the story here doesn't connect to all the previous games in the series at all. So no Joe Musashi or Neo Zed or whatever. But when you have live action cutscenes as good as this, I can deal with it. I'd say it's probably important to distance your expectations from previous games in the series because it's nowhere near as fast paced and intense as those. 
Apparently Sega of America had no faith in this game, leaving Vic Tokai to publish it in the US. Maybe they thought that the style just wouldn't resonate with audiences at the time. And heck, I guess that they were right, because Shinobi disappeared to the PlayStation 2. But checking this out now, I think that this was a lot better than it was probably ever given credit for. Wandering around this deserted island is making me want to go back home. These days, there's very few games that I tell myself that it's a priority to start them day one. It's even fewer and far between when I say this about a game that I know is going to be kind of long. When Ease 8, Lacrimosa of Donna, was released in September, it was time to clear my schedule. Now, I knew it was going to be a good game, but I didn't think it would ever be able to top the Oath and Felgana to become my favorite entry in the series. It's probably crazy for me to say it, but to me, this is basically Ease in its ultimate form. Serious protagonist and ultimate badass, Adol Kristen finds himself once again stranded on a desert island after a weird creature takes down the boat he was on. Together with the other castaways, they build a small village and work together to explore the island. What they find there is a surprise to everybody. It's all about the story and gameplay, which is crazy good and extremely fun to play. 8's soundtrack, as expected from Sound Team JDK, is a home run. Now, Ease 8 was published this time around by NIS instead of XSEED, who published the last few games. A lot has been made of 8's less than stellar translation. I guess I've just dealt with some not so great translations in my life that I barely even thought about it or noticed. It absolutely did not hinder my enjoyment of the game at all. Regardless, NIS is going to be releasing a patch to touch up a lot of the stuff that people had issues with. I don't know, to me, that sounds like a great excuse to replay the game. <laughs> Bring it on! I'm better at these types of things! Come on, ancient species! I, Dogie, will take you all on! I could not believe how quickly Cory devoured Ez8, and he got me really hyped up for it, so I can't wait to play it myself. But a few PS4 games that I played this year, of course Resident Evil 7 was released to wide praise for going back to its roots and reinventing the franchise at the same time. But what impresses me so much is how well it balances the tropes that make Resident Evil Resident Evil while still being more restrained. It's terrifying while still being fun and even if I have actually mostly enjoyed Resident Evil's derailment into action territory, it's a relief to see Capcom reassess the series and make it a bit more grounded, but not too grounded. Persona 5 was my reward for finishing the episode on RGB and component switchers. I just binged it, playing the game from beginning to end in about 115 hours and two and a half weeks. That might sound kind of crazy, but I don't know, it felt pretty great. I'll reveal your true form. I played Life is Strange with friends on a series of streams over the course of a couple of months. After what was, in my opinion, a slower first episode, I got really invested in the story and mystery of Max, Chloe, and Arcadia Bay. The story has a lot of intense moments and truly tough choices, and developer Don't Nod is definitely on my radar if they can continue to make this sort of storytelling their forte. Okay, so this isn't exactly a totally new game to me, but I do want to cheat a bit and give a mention to the HD Zodiac Age version of Final Fantasy XII. Spending a couple of weeks running through an old favorite didn't do any favors for my backlog, but it was some much needed gaming comfort food and really reinforced that it's my favorite Final Fantasy game outside the SNES PS1 Golden Age. A bit of a lesser known one, but I grabbed Limited Run's physical release of The Swapper, which turned out to be one of my favorite games they published in 2017. 
I've got a huge soft spot for platforming puzzlers, and The Swapper manages to be just as engaging in this regard as it is with its story that keeps you second guessing if you are still you. 2017 in games will probably mostly be remembered as the year that brought us the Nintendo Switch, and it didn't take long before it was clear that Nintendo could still find success in the hardware business. Super Mario Odyssey was the biggest exclusive for the system, and it was wonderful to get an open-ended 3D Mario to explore for the first time since 2002. This is a game that has no problem with doing silly, ridiculous, and completely out of place things in the name of fun, and it's a journey I'll never forget. And lastly, of course, there's The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. Nothing in this episode is really meant to be part of a ranked list or anything, but I think it's safe to say that if we wanted to declare one game of the year for both of us, this would be it. When I realized that our trip to Los Angeles to shoot James Riley's interview for our Night Trap documentary would start only a couple days after the Switch launch, I was a bit disappointed that I wouldn't have more time to get fully engrossed in Breath of the Wild on my TV at home in the way that I'd envisioned but sometimes the best experiences come about in a way that you'd never expect. And for us, playing Breath of the Wild in Switch handheld mode on our LA trip is something we'll never forget. Going into Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, I knew two things, what it looked like, and it was an open world take on the series that was supposed to harken back to the first game. In the last couple of years, I've kind of got myself into a bit of a routine where I know if I'm going to buy a game, I absolutely stop paying attention to it after I see the first trailer. This helps remove me from the hype and just kind of allows me to enjoy a game for what it is, without any real extra baggage. Due to Breath of the Wild's non-linear game structure, my limited knowledge of the game, and along with an extended trip, created the perfect storm of a game experience that neither of us expected. In many ways, it went back to a feeling of children sharing game discoveries on the playground at school. We went back and forth, sharing with each other stuff that we discovered in the world. And because of the game's lesser story focus, we could do this without fear of spoiling anything for each other. There was this whole world full of hundreds, if not thousands of things to discover, and pretty much all of it was a complete surprise to both of us. It's a deeply challenging game, but one that rewards patience. You could die at any moment, but the wonder that lies just beyond the hardship you might be facing is enough to get you to try again and again. Hyrule's sense of scale is something not seen in many games. You truly feel like you can go anywhere, and that there's no limits. And you know what? There basically isn't. Of course I'm not saying that it's a perfect game. Breakable weapons were fairly annoying, and the music lacked that grandeur that I was really hoping for going in. But in pretty much all aspects, Breath of the Wild comes together under a vision with pinpoint accuracy. It's hard to say that the next time a game will have this sort of impact on the world of gaming. The last one had to be Mario 64, and before that, Super Mario Brothers. Okay, okay, listen. I like the Zelda series. I don't love this series. In fact, I say that the only game in the series that I truly love is Link to the Past. But I think it's safe to say that Breath of the Wild stands tall alongside that game and far and away ranks as my favorite game of the year. It wasn't just the game, but it was the situation and circumstances I found myself in that made it transcend beyond what the game is at its core. It was an experience, and I absolutely will never forget it. Twenty seventeen was an equal parts of big year and a bit of an off year for my life in gaming. Early on we knew we were probably going to be able to produce a documentary about Night Trap, which we were so excited about that it became kind of hard to focus on anything else. We really want documentaries to become a major pillar of the channel, and this was our coolest opportunity yet. And of course, there were a number of big RGB episodes, including the 200 level videos on Saturn and PS2. But at the same time, we also had a lot of long gaps between releases. Month-long gaps, which had never happened before in all of the channel's four years. We kept having these 
impromptu apology sessions during our Sunday night live streams about the wait for episodes. We feel that we got super hung up on bigger episodes in 2017. And it was sort of a wake up call for us to realize that we need to refocus how we work in 2018. We still plan to do big episodes when the topic calls for it, but we also want to try out a lot of smaller topics that we think are just as interesting and we can release more quickly. We've already got some documentary type stuff falling into place for 2018. And don't worry, there's plenty of RGB episodes coming too. To all the new fans that just joined us this year, and those of you who have been around since the beginning, thanks for being along for the ride. Even though we've been at it for four years now, trust us when we say we're just getting started. Thank you.